Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Andrew Capetta, the manager of collection and exhibition programs at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I'd like to welcome you to today's desktop dialogue. Uh, while other guests are joining us, uh, use this time to familiarize yourself with the chat interface. Uh, to join the chat, just enter your name or really any name that you prefer uh, and click to agree to the terms of service and the privacy policy. You can use this chat to make comments during the program at any time. Uh, and when you have a question, you can pop it in the chat too. Uh, I know we might have a lot of folks joining us from other places today besides Northeast Ohio. So if you want to let us know where you're coming from, that'd be great. Uh, below the screen is a list of web resources that relate to this afternoon's program. So feel free to, to, feel free to take a look at those now or later. Uh, and lastly, this program is being recorded, so you can watch it later on the CMA website or on our YouTube channel. Uh, maybe you need to leave a little bit early or you want to share with a friend. It should be up on those spaces tomorrow. Uh, so for today's program, uh, which is titled Storytelling in Japanese Art, we are going to uh, look closely at an illustrated hand scroll uh, of the family drama The Salt Maker's Story. Uh, or titled Bunsho Zoshi, uh, and learned how to read it through the eyes of two scholars who are going to reveal the meaning uh, of a lot of the important narrative details. Uh, so this afternoon uh, for this program, we're really lucky to have with us uh, two museum colleagues. Uh, first is uh, Gina Lopez, who is a senior at Case Western Reserve University and a CMA intern. Uh, so welcome, Gina. Thanks, Andrew. Hi. Right. Uh, and then also uh, Sinead Vilbar, who Gina has worked closely with, um, who's uh, the CMA's curator of Japanese art. Welcome, Sinead. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Gina. It's great to have you both. Um, Sinead and Gina are going to share their investigative research process. And we, um, during the program, we really invite you, our audience, to ask questions and make comments. Uh, about what you're seeing too, so please join in the dialogue using the chat. We're going to turn to your questions at the end of the program, and in the middle there's going to be a little bit of sort of audience interaction, so stay tuned for that as well. Um, so I thought I'd start off by um, asking you, Sinead, why we're looking at this scroll today and how you chose it uh, as a focus for Gina's independent study. Well, Andrew, all scholarship at the museum, as you know, has a practical component. And I noticed that the museum's uh, version of this narrative had no information in our public facing collections online. So it was clear to me that we needed to work on it. And plus, who doesn't like a fun story? No, completely. So it's great that, you know, Gina's work is going to be of great value, right, to the museum uh, in the future, mm -hmm. as all internships are. So, Gina, could you tell us a little bit more about the Saltmaker story and what this uh, narrative is about? Yeah, of course. Um, so the tale of Buncho, the Saltmaker, in a very broad sense, is about a man of good, of lowborn um, birth. And he comes upon good fortune, um, basically a rags to riches story. Um, and before reaching this good fortune, he was born as Bunda and worked for the grand priest of Kashima, who held him in high regard. Um, this priest recognized his great work, his great service, and tells him that he could live wherever he wishes. Um, so the story really begins from there. Excellent. Now, I think we're going to be looking at the first scene of this Rags to Riches story. Uh, can you tell us like what's happening in this particular scene and how it begins? What are we seeing here? Sure. Um, so I would like to preface that um, the foundation of our research um, or our study in general was based on a translation of one version of the text by James T. Araki. Um, and in his translation of the Saltmaker story, Bunda had no particular place in mind, um, and he ended up on the coast of Sanuka, where salt was manufactured. So this first scene um, of the CMA scroll illustrates that very moment. Um, to the right is Bunda, who is shown to be curious about his new surroundings, mm -hmm. noticing um, huts where salt was being made um, to the center and the left of the composition. You can see his hand on his chin investigating his surroundings. <laughs> um, 
and he ends up working um, for a salt maker who becomes fond of him, uh, much like his old boss, the Grand Priest. And uh, the salt maker gives Bunda two kilns where he begins to manufacture salt himself. Um, and after much success, he adopts the name Buncho and then becomes married. Um, so we're going to be moving on to uh, one of the next scenes in the scroll. So this scene um, illustrates Buncho and his wife um, outside of the Kashima shrine. Uh, throughout their marriage, Buncho and his wife uh, did not bear any children. Uh, so he went to go consult his old boss, uh, the grand priest, about this. Um, the priest congratulates Buncho on all his successes thus far, but he mentions that uh, no man can have a greater treasure than children. Um, so he encourages Buncho um, to offer treasures to the gods and the Buddhas so him and his wife can be blessed with children. Um, in the narrative, his wife was very skeptical of this, um, especially at first because she was 40 in the text, mm -hmm. and um, she didn't think it was possible for her to have a kid, um, but Buncho persisted. Um, so she went to the great deity, deity of uh, Kashima to ask for a child. Um, and what's interesting is that although um, the translation of the text that Sinead and I read, um, Buncho, Buncho's wife is the only one who goes to the Kashima shrine, um, mm -hmm. but in the CMA scroll, it shows both Buncho and his wife offering mm -hmm. gifts to Kashima, which could hint to another um, version of the text. Interesting, that's really good to know. So uh, Sinead, could you tell, tell us, uh, tell me and also our audience, what is Kashima? Is it a particular deity or a religion or is it something else? Well, uh, Kashima, Andrew, refers both to a location uh, in Japan that's sort of northeast of uh, modern-day Tokyo, and it also refers to Kashima Shrine, which is a Shinto shrine uh, occupied by the Kashima deity. Awesome. Thanks, Sinead. Um, so we're going to be moving on to, I think, the next scene here. Perfect. Um, after um, praying to Kashima, Buncho confronts his wife, um, wishing for her to give birth to a boy. Uh, she ends up giving birth to a girl who lacked not one of the 32 aspects of beauty, referring to the 32 distinguishing physical markers of the Buddha, um, which uh, is also a characterization for feminine beauty in medieval Japanese literature. Um, Buncho was outraged by this, exclaiming, how dare you go back on your promise and give birth to a girl? He wanted a boy really bad. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, uh, that strikes me as like rather sort of misogynistic. Is that something that is of Buncho, but maybe also of larger social norms? Is this sort of a common, at least, belief in this culture at that time? Yeah, um, kind of, yes. So, uh, Basically, Buncho's thoughts are uh, related to the future prospects of the child. Um, he thinks that his son can bring the family good fortune, much like he did, um, but is then corrected through the counsel of others. So this scene in the CMA scroll um, illustrates this very part of the Saltmaker's story. To the right um, is Buncho's wife sitting amongst her attendants post-labor, and to the left corner, um, an attendant is bringing Buncho, his daughter, and explains to him that it's really girls who bring prosperity and good fortune, so he ends up treating her with affection. Um, and about a year later, his wife has another daughter. He's outraged once again, but uh, is reminded that if he had a son, the only employment that his son could have would be under the grand priest, not something of super high rank. So um, daughters of exceptional beauty like his um, could marry well and bring prosperity to his family. As time goes on, as his daughters get older, um, the rulers of the eight provinces get wind of Buncho's daughters, and uh, they uh, strove to win their affection, um, but the daughters were really focused um, on their dedication to Buddhism and wanted essentially nothing to do with these men. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds, it's good that Buncho was converted in some ways to see the value in his daughters, which is wonderful. But I also sense that there's maybe some foreshadowing here 
Uh, is there some sort of love story ahead or kind of matchmaking to come in the story? Is that where we're going here? Oh yeah, most definitely. So um, one rejected suitor um, met with the prime minister's son who was a captain um, and describes the daughters to be refined, beautiful with a lot of character and also they're great at performing arts. Um, so basically they're out of this world. Um, and solely through this description, the captain falls in love with the daughters. He ends up devising a plan to travel to Buncho's home with his attendants. And they knew that they would be recognized while traveling because being the prime minister's son kind of means you're a little bit of a celebrity. So uh, they decided to go in disguise as merchants. Um, yeah. Now Oh, so we're, I think we're looking at a scene where they're right, um, kind of on their travels. Like how uh, it does make sense that they're in disguise. That sounds safe. Um, but how can we tell in this scene? What what clues made you pick up on that? Sure. Um, so for one thing, we can compare their travel wear um, with their clothes that they were wearing at court um, later and also earlier on in the story. Um, later on, they change back into their regular clothes. So we're going to show some comparison um, images here. Um, so the scene on the left uh, illustrates the captain and his men at court um, earlier on. Uh, the captain is on the right of the scene on the raised green tatami um, with the folding mm -hmm. screen behind him um, while his men are sitting outside. Uh, the captain is shown in a blue robe um, with a fine detailed diamond pattern um, and his super tall hat. Um, and in comparison to the image we last saw, um, also detailed on the right, um, his men are wearing similar colors to their court clothing. One is wearing orange, another yellow, um, which is how we know which one is which um, when they're disguised in in their merchant gear. Um, and then uh, going back to the full image here, we can see that um, the boxes that they're carrying, one has a lid open showing garments or some textiles. And we know who the captain um, is in this scene because in the text, he was conversing with an old man that they encountered um, along along their way of the travels. Um, the captain tells the old man that uh, they are merchants carrying goods from the capital to sell in Hitachi, where Buncho and his family are. Um, but yeah. the old man sees past their disguise um, and says, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think you are who you say you are. <laughs> I think that you're the prime minister's son. But he also says that he foresees uh, love in his future. So it's getting juicy oh, wow. here. <laughs> Oh, it's getting really juicy. Yeah, exactly. And seeing, and also seeing their seeing their formal clothes, it makes sense why they needed to change it to something a little more practical um, for 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 traveling. But I also like this idea that they're found out. But you know, but essentially, uh, this um, kind of fortune teller figure kind of foresees it being a good thing. You know, so maybe yeah, good things lie ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so they were definitely found out <laughs> their their words and their actions, um, which tended to be more elegant than those of a merchant uh, gave them away. Um, uh, something I would like to mention um, is that in the scene, um, there's a large uh, portion that is dedicated to landscape at the very end. Um, this was very typical in scrolls to use expansive landscapes to show a passage of time, which especially makes sense here because we're at the end of the very first scroll, moving into the second scroll. So moving into um, this scene, uh, between the end of our first scroll and the scene in scroll two, uh, the captain and his attendants make a pit stop at Kashima Shrine. Um, the men spend the night there in prayer, asking for the Kashima deity to grant the captain the ability to meet Buncho's daughters. Um, the next day at Buncho's estate, which is illustrated in this scene here, the captain and his men on the right, uh, they're resting near their merchant boxes while a maid goes to retrieve Buncho. Uh, this happens right after the captain describes the wares that they brought with such elegance that the maid suspects that he is not a commoner. Uh, she's very wary of him, much like the old man in the mountains from earlier on. And um, never hearing such an elegant solicitation like this, she went to go get Buncho so that he could repeat the pitch for him. 
Um, Bucho was essentially like so blown away by this pitch that he invited the guys to his home to lodge for the night. It's, it's really funny that all these minor characters seem to really suspect that these traveling merchants are not merchants, right? Um, it may be, maybe their disguises are really bad, uh, as you're kind of pointing out, right? It's like, wait, these seem, people seem too elegant. But maybe it's also interesting that Buncho seems to fall for it. Is that kind of a commentary mm -hmm. on him being like a little bit gullible? Or does it just, is he, does it just add some drama and intrigue? You know what I mean? Is he, it just, does it fall on Buncho to sort of keep the story, keep the farce going, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so I'm suspecting that because Buncho himself was someone of a lower class who ended up earning his fortune, that he has a hard time identifying the captain's disguise because he himself is someone who's sort of also playing the part of someone in a different class. Um, it also seems that the author, whoever that might be, we really don't know, um, use, uses Buncho as like a pocket source for comedy throughout the narrative. Um, the joke's kind of on him because he's not able to recognize someone of lower rank that's right in front of him, uh, much like he wasn't able to recognize uh, the good fortune that his daughters could bring him. Um, so great question, Andrew, thanks. Um, so continuing on with the narrative, um, after Buncho invites the merchants to lodge with him, he offers them a place to relax in his hall of worship. Um, the men went to the hall, they began to play their instruments uh, surrounding them, and the captain played the biwa or the lute, um, and everyone surrounding Buncho's estate was entranced by them and the music, and Buncho himself says it, it erased his past sins. That's how good they were. Wow, that's their their amazing performer. So now, how? No, this is a compl complex scene to me because there's lots of figures and characters. Um, you know, where is Buncho, the the, uh, the the captain, the merchant, the captain? Could you kind of uh, read this for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so differentiating the characters uh, was really difficult for me, especially during my first run throughs um, of the scrolls. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, um, their outfits um, stay the same throughout the scrolls. Mm -hmm. uh, the only times that we see differences are at the beginning of the tale when Buncho was a servant and um, also the mm -hmm. captain and his men while they're in disguise. So our mm -hmm. main characters here are situated more towards the center of the composition. Um, after Buncho uh, becomes a salt maker, he is shown wearing his all black outfit with his little white details, some red underlayers. Um, and he's also sitting in front of the bamboo blinds uh, to the left of the center of the composition. Mm -hmm. Um, when identifying his daughter, it's during this musical performance when a gust of wind lifts the bamboo blinds where his daughter's sitting behind. Um, and here is where the captain and her lock eyes for the first time. So we have determined that she is the figure um, behind the bamboo blind. Um, you can get a whole glimpse of her. So we, we guess that was her because the other um, heads that we can see in the lower corner of the composition are not as prominent. So that's how we know she's she's one of the main characters here. Um, going on to a detail of the scene, um, the captain mm. is shown out of his merchant clothes and back into his regular garb that we saw earlier. Mm. Um, and he's sitting across from Buncho in blue. We know who he is because in the tale, he's the one playing the lute. And that is what um, this character is holding right here. Um, and like I mentioned, their, their clothes stay pretty continuous uh, throughout the scrolls. So that definitely helped us in picking them out. Right, so you, to understand the scene or the scroll, you know, as a whole, you're looking across the, the, the different scenes and noticing what the characters are wearing. Mm -hmm. You're also consulting the text, obviously, like the gust of wind that you just mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, but what else, what other sources did you consult uh, to interpret the CMA um, scroll of Buncho Soshi? So besides reading the text and doing the comparison uh, with the CMA scrolls, part of my research also included finding other existing uh, Buncho scrolls to compare to ours. So I happened upon another scroll version, um, which was from the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. That was pretty helpful to me. So we will show a comparison of the two coming up next. Um, Perfect. Awesome. 
Whoa. So yeah, so here we have <laughs> uh, here we have the comparison um, between the Chester Beatty scroll at the top and then the CMA scroll on the bottom. Um, the Chester Beatty scroll depicts uh, this scene at least depicts the same musical scene in the Hall of Worship in the story that we see in the CMA scroll. And the most obvious difference that we can point out is that the Chester Beatty scroll includes text. Um, so mm -hmm. this text would have aided the readers in finding visual cues of key moments um, in the narrative on the illustrated scenes themselves. Um, and the CMA's version um, of the scrolls were acquired without the text, um, which is one reason why deciphering what is happening in the illustrated scenes is kind of difficult, but also I don't read classical Japanese, so it's not like they would necessarily help me anyway. Um, awesome. So here we have a detail of the Chester Beatty scene uh, without text above um, in comparison to the CMA scene below. Mm -hmm. And although the subject matter is the same, there are many stylistic and compositional differences here. Um, so I was hoping for some audience participation, um, looking at both the CMA scene and the Chester Beatty scene, um, I was hoping for people to point out maybe some uh, visual differences or similarities uh, that they see. And Andrew and Sinead, uh, feel free to jump in with your thoughts too while we get those uh, questions or statements coming in. Yeah, I guess the, the first thing I see is that different, the, the, the Chester Beatty one seems to be zoomed out a little bit. Um, um, but I see some similar, uh, like the, the green tatami mat, which I think is what you called it earlier, uh, and the sort of um, uh, wall, uh, screens as walls, right? So similar architecture. Um, Sinead, what about you? What are some, as a scholar and, and, and a curator of this, what, are, what, are, what, is, what is one thing your eye is drawn to? Uh, well, uh, for me, uh, when I was looking at uh, the CMA version with Gina, uh, I found that it's quite interesting to see above uh, the head of the koto player, uh, the man mm. playing the, the long stringed instrument, uh, we can see the character kin, which indicates gold. And uh, we can see the same characters appearing to the left and right of the altar in the same worship hall. And this tells us that uh, the creators of the scroll were intending to farm out uh, the application of gold uh, to someone outside of their studio. Uh, They're going to sort of subcontract to a gold specialist. And because some of that gold has now fallen away, uh, we can see that color notation. That's wonderful. That's a great sort of thing that I think only a specialist, right? And, and But it tells us about production, which is really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, we have some great uh, comments. Um, and actually, I'm just going to, they keep coming in, which is exciting. But Robin Glassman says the colors are similar. So that's kind of interesting. Um, maybe these, these are similar, work, you know, kinds of processes that uh, are being done. Leah says you see more of the house in the top behind the mats. Uh, Anya Mickelberger says there's um, uh, more, uh, sorry, I keep jumping. There's more of the objects behind the curtain. Gretchen says you don't have the servants gallery in the, ch in the Chester Beatty one, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, Catherine Jacobson says the transparent bamboo screens are really striking. Uh, there's also, someone says something really interesting about the princesses or maybe the female figures are playing music in the Chester Beatty uh, version. These are really wonderful um, observations. Um, Gina, do you have anyone that you're particularly drawn to? Um, so definitely a lot of great observations here. Um, I'm going to kind of tie everyone's observations in with um, some things that I've noted as well. Um, so the Chester Beatty scene uh, focuses on secular aspects of the narrative. There's um, landscape, um, outside, there's screens in the interior hall, which um, some people have mentioned, as well as the textiles that we can see inside of um, the quarters where the ladies in waiting are. Um, and the CMA scene 
I'm not sure if anyone mentioned this in the in the chat, um, but we see the glimpse of the bottom of a Buddhist icon uh, between Buncho mm -hmm. and the captain. Um, the artist who created the scene here could have been sampling um, room interiors from a pre-existing scroll, uh, but we don't really mm -hmm. know what the production context was in order to establish the artist's motive here. Um, in depicting a scene with an icon in the background. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely some same colors going on. We get that green from the green tatami mat um, mm -hmm. going. Um, so it, there's definitely continuity there, um, as well as in terms of general subject matter. So the bamboo blind is blowing up in both. Um, the captain's clothing is also um, similar and um, the instruments that each man was playing is also similar too. Um, so great, thank you everyone for your participation there. Um, we're gonna move forward into the next scene of the scroll. Um, so this next scene in the Cleveland scroll depicts what happens after the performance in the hall of worship. The captain has gone into the quarters of the elder daughter uh, where she kept her lattice window open to gaze upon the moon. Um, and we see the younger daughter in the apartment above uh, peeping down upon them. Um, and in this moment in the narrative, uh, the captain and Buncho's elder daughter become intimate, uh, they exchange poems, and it's mentioned that they're bound together in love. Um, mm -hmm. So this is one of the last scenes in the CMA scroll um, also, which holds some sort of continuity in terms of um, scene order, which we dive into more moving forward. I, I, I wonder if this is the equivalent, like in a you know a, a romantic comedy or romance, the, when the two you know love lovers, intended lovers, kiss. You know, <laughs> that's when they declare their intentions. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So the next morning, as uh, a mom might be appalled at this, uh, Buncho's <laughs> wife was basically appalled that the daughter chose to be with a merchant. Um, rather than one of the daimyos or uh, the governor that came after them earlier. But as we already know, the merchant is not a merchant after all. Um, and the captain actually outranks all of the previous suitors. Um, so moving forward, we um, have another moment of discontinuity in terms of scene order. Um, the scene, we can see attendants or ladies in waiting bustling around a portion of a, an estate. Um, but the estate pictured here does not seem to have any visual cues that relate it uh, to Buncho's, which we saw earlier, um, which lends us evidence that this is taking place somewhere else. Um, we know mm -hmm. that the scene depicts cap the captain and Buncho's eldest daughter because their clothing is pretty continuous throughout the scrolls. Um, we're gonna show a detailed image here awesome of the elder daughter um she's slightly more dressed up than she than we've seen her before mm -hmm. um she has more layers of robes indicating that the location that she's at is pretty important so this scene is most likely taking place after the captain and the elder daughter get married and return to the capital um, where they have children um, in the lower portion of the scene, um, in this detail here, we can see a young lady in multi-layered robes um, next to the elder daughter. This is probably her daughter, um, but we have no full description of the children in James Tiaraki's translated text. Um, there's also indication of another child who's being held by a nurse uh, diagonally to the right of the young lady. Um, and this would be another one of their children, probably a boy. Um, we know that uh, they both had boys and girls to description, due to descriptions um, of similar scenes in the Meizei University and Kyoto University library versions of the narrative, which uh, Sinead has uh, found. But um, by this portion of the story, Buncho's younger daughter also elevates the family's status mm -hmm. by becoming an imperial consort um, and gives birth to an imperial prince um, in some versions that goes on to become emperor. Um, but as I mentioned, the scene is out of order because um, 
our last scene in the second CMA scroll portrays a version of the story uh, that, sorry, a portion of the story that occurs before the captain and the elder daughter have children. Um, Between the scene where Buncho's elder daughter and the captain get together, Buncho, his wife, Uh and uh, Buncho's old boss, the grand priest, find out the captain's true identity. Um, And the text mentions that the captain wanted to return to the capital with his bride, escorted by the rulers of the Eastern lands um, with their mounted warriors. Um, So this scene depicts uh, the captain riding back to the capital with his new wife to start their life together. Um, And although this is the last scene depicted in the scroll, uh, the narrative of the of the text continues, um, which we know. Uh, The captain and the elder daughter have children. The younger daughter has uh, becomes an imperial consort, has a son. Um, But in the end, it seems that it was really Buncho's daughters that brought him good fortune after all. So I I guess I have a more technical question. Why would they be out of order? Why would they be out of order? Yeah. I believe I briefly mentioned this um, earlier, but the scrolls were taken apart and pieced back together before the CMA acquired them. Um, This is also why the text is not included in our scrolls. So whoever put the scenes back together or took out the text um, in the second scroll must not have necessarily been following the narrative of the story to a T, um, maybe because they didn't know it or we, we can only really speculate so much. No, and then so now that we're at this sort of close of the um, the story, uh, I'm kind of wondering: is there is is it a bit of a sort of a, a morality tale in some ways um, that we're seeing here? In terms of, I'm thinking of how Buncho and his wife, you know, prayed to the Kashima deity, and they received this in some ways wonderful fortune of having their daughters bring incredible success to the family? Is that what we're looking at here? Like, you know, these kind of good actions um, or being a devout, um, you know, um, Shinto believer leads to these good good things happening? So it's safe to say that Buncho and his family are definitely the winners in this tale. Um, as far as the salt maker story kind of being a morality tale, Not quite sure I would call it that, but maybe yes, in the sense that Buncho learns that his greater success has been fulfilled um, by having daughters who he looked down upon at first. Um, The very last line of the tale is, at the first felicitous act of the year, you should read the story without fail. And um, it was tradition for girls to perform their first reading of in the new year and the last line of the tale emphasizes that the salt maker's story would be a part of that first reading tradition um james t Araki suggests that this story would have been esteemed in the edo period um because it would foresee a good fortune from uh, shinto deities among commoners and mm-hmm. when seeking support from kami or shinto <clears throat> gods um individuals are normally praying to help for is- with issues in this world um such as mm-hmm. doing well on a test or hoping for good childbirth having a child in general um monetary mm-hmm. success that kind of Thing. So, um, unlike monotheistic religions, kami veneration does not necessarily focus on absolutes such as um, right versus wrong, um, which is why I kind of struggle to call the salt maker story a morality tale. Mm-hmm. That's a great answer, uh, Gina. It's very insightful. Um, as for the Kashima deity, one of our uh, listeners or participants today asked if the Kashima deity was associated with anything in particular. Um, in fact, uh, Kashima was an important outpost uh, for the military government of Japan at one point uh, because the population uh, known as Ezo was living north of the area and the Japanese government was trying to subdue them. Uh, So the Kashima deity is actually associated with military prowess and in particular um, 
uh, archery. Uh, and interestingly, that plays uh, no role uh, in this particular narrative whatsoever, uh, but it does uh, indicate in the broader culture uh, one of the reasons Kashima was seen as such an important shrine. Mm -hmm. right. no, thank you, Sinead. That's a really great sort of encapsulation on, mm -hmm. on the sort of belief systems and how they how they sort of connect to this story and, and Gina as well. So I know we have a ton of questions and I want to get to them, but for really briefly, I want to know, Gina, like how did how did you end up at CMA? Like how did you develop this interest in Japanese art? Just you know, really, you know, briefly, if you could tell us. Yeah, Some so kind of it's definitely a story within itself. So I'm gonna make it short. But um, basically, a few years ago, I became an intern. Um, in the CMA's Department of Education and Academic Affairs as a student guide, um, did some fun activities, um, did a lot of object-based research, um, led some mixed uh, gallery talks and such. Um, but also in fall of 2019, I um, wrote a blog post for CMA's Thinker, um, which was based on my experience as a student guide, as well as um, it focused on Tenny Buncho's watching a waterfall hanging scroll in the Japanese galleries at the time. Um, so after the blog post was published, um, Kijo Lee, the director of academic affairs, um, who led the pro student guide program, uh, put me in touch with Sinead. Um, we mm -hmm. met, we talked in the atrium of the CMA, um, mm -hmm. talked about our backgrounds, all that fun stuff. Um, I applied for a few internships with her and, um, last summer, I reached out to her about doing an independent study for my mm -hmm. senior year at Case, um, because the Department of Art History at Case was kind of lacking in terms of covering East Asian art, um, which is my area of interest. So the rest was kind of history from there. Yeah. Awesome. And then Sinead, um, what, what has having Gina as an intern, you know, brought you as a scholar? What have you learned from, from her uh, as sort of a younger generation of scholar? Um, well, Andrew, for me, um, working with interns is all about dialogue, uh, like the one we're having today. And working in a community in which we foster mutual curiosity in the world. And sharing successes uh, where we figure out what's happening in the scene makes them much sweeter and setbacks where maybe we can't figure out what's going on or the order is, is not helping us. Uh, those setbacks are less impactful because I was experiencing them uh, with a fellow person in pursuit of a goal. So in a sense, failing together is more fun. And for me also, it's possible to rediscover a sense of hope through intellectual challenges uh, when they're interspersed with moments of, of simple camaraderie and togetherness. And uh, I should say recently, I lost my graduate school advisor, mm -hmm. uh, Yoshiaki Shimizu of Princeton University. And the gift that he gave me most that I really want to pass along is this value of intellectual community. Uh, Gina has a terrific sense of visual acuity. And I really benefited from giving her some simple tools to hone it further uh, so that she can really help all of us see new things in art too. And it's been such a tremendous ongoing uh, pleasure to work with her on these scrolls. So I'm really looking no, forward to what going to do in the future. I know, and I as well, and I think everyone out there too. Um, yeah, the idea of collaboration being central to scholarship, I think is is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful lesson to have learned. Um, so why don't we turn to some questions? Um, and I'm gonna try and consolidate some if that's okay. 
Um, there is a kind of a really straightforward question from Catherine Jacobson, and maybe this is a good one for you, um, Gina, since I know you, you both know the school, but you, you know, you've looked at it so closely. In the core clothes, are the shapes on top of their heads meant to be hats or elaborate hairstyles? And I think you can see them in this image as well of the, if we're looking at it, the sort of procession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, generally they are hats. Um, I know that in some cases, hair can be part of, you know, how they're put up, but Sinead might have a little bit more information on that than I do. Well, I, yes, Gina, absolutely. We've got hats here and we've got an eboshi hat, uh, which is um, the hat that looks um, a bit like a cone. Uh, and then we also have, um, uh, in, in this scene, uh, you can see, for example, in the captain, uh, he's got the uh, eboshi hat, and then he's got uh, the, uh, um, I, I hesitate to call it a sash, because I know that's not the right English term, but there's a, a textile piece that comes down the back. Uh, mm -hmm. So hats like this are indicating rank uh, in most cases. Thank you. And there's a question actually, while we have this image up, um, Ann Tubbs asks, can you talk about the type of pigment you used? And maybe this is a good question for you, Sinead. Where did, for example, they get that green for the tatami? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have an awareness of, Sinead? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we haven't done any pigment analysis on these particular scrolls. Uh, however, uh, in general, we can say that the uh, pigments used were mineral pigments. Uh, they're ground mm. down and mixed with an animal glue uh, and applied to the surface. Um, there, there's a really wonderful question from Julie Ketterer that just came in that I would love to ask, and it's to, to really Gina or Sinead, and maybe we go to Gina first and maybe you, Sinead, briefly, but do you see the salt maker story as an early feminist fable? Mm. Oh, interesting question, for sure. Um, I am not sure I would define it as a feminist fable, um, mostly because like that right now that's kind of more of a, a modern or contemporary conception. I'm not sure if we can apply it to Buncho um, Soshi and, you know, its intent of its intent. Um, but definitely the marriage politics um, of it could possibly lend to that, you know, using um, your daughters to rise in rank um, through marriage. So uh, that's that's my two cents on that. <laughs> Well, I might mention that uh, this uh, Bunsho Zoshi was also uh, made part of uh, dowries uh, or wedding trousseau uh, for women who were getting married. Um, and I think it really depends on one's uh, personal uh, thoughts on the power of uh, social position through marriage as to whether it could qualify as a feminist tale or not. Um, I personally think that the, the idea of needing to associate with a uh, male uh, through marriage in order to gain agency uh, would be a bit of a uh, problem. Uh, but if that was what was available to you in your society at the time, uh, one might look at it differently. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a great, you know, it's a great reflection uh, on, you know, how we, you know, the care you have to take with viewing something from a, you know, in a, from a prior moment and that sort of care you take in not applying or thinking about what were the ideas then, right? Uh, so I think we're going to wrap things up this afternoon. And I want to thank you so much, Gina. And thank you so much, Sinead. This has been a wonderful experience for me. I've learned a ton. So thank you for being here.
Thank you so much for having us. This is a great experience, yeah. Yeah, it's a very fun um, to show off the scroll and we'll put it out in the galleries in October this year. Wonderful news. Uh, so all of you in Northeast Ohio want to come for a trip, you can see Buncho Soshi this fall. So and I want to thank everyone out there for joining us. Uh, Desktop Dialogues has been made possible. Uh, in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Uh, and I welcome you all to join us in two weeks for our next Desktop Dialogue on Wednesday, March 17th at noon. It is the first of four programs uh, that are going to accompany the CMA exhibition, Stories from Storage, uh, developed in collaboration with the creative writing organization, Literary Cleveland. This series invites four local, st local storytellers to offer artful interpretations of select objects on view in the show. Uh, and for the first chapter, we're going to have playwright Eric Koble, uh, who's going to draw from photographs of popular tourist locales to create the dramatic monologue, That Which Can Be Held. So if you log in in two weeks, you can watch Koble's live performance. And afterwards, join him and curator Barbara Tannenbaum for a, a lively conversation about the fantasy and romance of travel in image and spoken word. Um, so find out more about this and other upcoming programs at cma.org. If you would like to explore more of the work in our collection, visit CMA's collection online. And if we didn't get to your question during the program, I know there are many, or if you have more, you can always go to Artlands Ask on the CMA website and someone will get back to you with an answer. So I, I urge all of you with those great questions to send them to us that way. And links for all of the things I just mentioned are below. Uh, so thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon and stay well.